Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to the first EdTech Talks uh, discussion from Atlona. This presentation started from a discussion at ETC uh, about multicast and the fact that AV directors might be a little afraid to talk to their IT counterparts about multicast. So I've gathered a group of end users, other manufacturers, and product managers from Atlona to really talk about it, right? This is not necessarily a product demo. This is really more discussing the topic of multicast, why we care, why we think it's the, the future of AV, and uh, how to ask the right questions. So with that, let's get started. First, I want to start by introducing our panelists, uh, Chris Bergen from OU. Say hello. Hello, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Next, we have Alex Pendleton from Netgear. Alex, sign in, please. Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you today. Alex just joining us from the Super Bowl. They were doing a bunch of uh, network stuff for the Super Bowl. So for all you Chiefs fans out there, congrats. For all you uh, 49er fans, sorry. <laughs> Next, we've got Paul Krizan, Network uh, AV Product Manager from Atlona. Well, hello, everybody. Glad to be here today. And last but not least, Wiley Durham from Atlona, Network Specialist. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Wiley. So I thought first we might jump into kind of some of the uh, terms and definitions that you might see. I don't want you to get scared that this is going to get overly technical. What we're talking about is really replacing that AV switch with a network switch. That's all we're really doing. But by it being an encoder based, it's a, a non-propriety, non-HD based T switch. It's a network switch. So that's what we're really digging into now. So Chris, you know, you're coming from an end user perspective. So give us maybe kind of some, some perspective on these terms and, and how you deal with it. So for me on these terms, they're good to know and know enough about to be dangerous from the AV side. <laughs> In essence, what you've got to be able to do is kind of talk the lingo enough to get the answers that you need from networking when you're having to work alongside them, which we're talking about putting video on the network. Sometimes that strikes fear. Sometimes that's warmly accepted, but you have to conform to any security standards and any other parameters that the network engineers have. So knowing these terms is helpful. You don't have to be an expert on them. You just have to kind of know and then we'll kind of get into this later, but don't be afraid to ask. Uh, if you're not really sure what that encompasses, then ask a trusted uh, network engineer about that. Yeah, network doesn't always have to come from the world of no, right? You know, I want to put multicast on the network. No, you don't. Because there's a lot of stuff that is multicast based. You don't want uncontrolled multicast on your network. But multicast on the network, there's a lot of functions that do that. And uh, Wiley, maybe you can talk about some of the things that are related to multicast that maybe we hadn't really even thought about. So as you can see by the slide, we have a lot of uh, a lot of things that run on multicast, network video, Dante, which could go either way, uh, multicast versus unicast, uh, uh, device discovery, bonjour, uh, video over IP, video on demand, which is, you know, some sometimes a unicast technology because in multicast you join the stream where it is, uh, and IPTV, you know, kind of similar to just a video over IP. So, I mean, one of the needs for multicast and in AV um, is for, you know, efficiency, uh, capacity or scalability and the ease of planning for multicast versus other technologies, which we'll get into later on. But, you know, a few examples, one of the benefits of multicast is you don't have to send an instance of the data to each receiver out there. Um, th there's one instance put out on the network and then the receivers will join it or not. So they're not utilizing, uh, you're not utilizing uh, bandwidth for each uh, device that wants to receive the data. Uh, on the other hand, uh, just like its counterpart unicast for each receiver, there's a stream and dedicated bandwidth per device. 
So we, we're, we're, we're going around that uh, with multicast. Awesome. So I'm an AV director and I'm thinking, hey, I want to try this new networked AV stuff. Chris, when, when should I get my uh, IT involved? If you don't already have a relationship with your IT and especially your IT engineers, the ones who manage the setup of the system, firewalls and even switch config, that's your main one then you need to go ahead and start forming that relationship. It needs to be a working relationship where you respect each other. Some people do have, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it this way. Some people do have a little bit of an ego. Some people are very humble and you have to be willing to flex with that because the last thing you want to do is create an enemy where a friend is really what you need. Then when you approach them with these AV, ask them questions approach them from me hey, i'm going to pick your brain because i want to know more about this i want to know what we're already doing and that way you never come off with we are going to do this and you have to conform they already get enough of that we want them to see us as a friend and as somebody that doesn't know as much as they do and we're trying to work together with them i've had some very in-depth discussions on some of the other audio video specific protocols and both of us have walked away learning from that with some of the engineers that I work with but that relationship and it's a working relationship it can even be a little bit of a casual you know co-worker type relationship but that type of relationship is paramount to getting past that initial no and getting their input and their knowledge of the network so would you suggest cash, cookies, brownies, maybe just coffee? Oh, no, it's, uh, it's going to be beer. It's going to be alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, alcohol? You know what your, <laughs> well, you know what your AV engineer or your, I'm sorry, your uh, network engineer, the person that you're working with likes. There's nothing wrong with, you know, going out for a lunch somewhere they like and just casually talking about stuff. I mean. Yeah, woo them a little bit. You know, you you are going to be asking for their help, so you want them on your side. So basically, their regional sales manager, like a manufacturer, we run into the same challenges. <laughs> and so, man managing multicast is you know what we're trying to do, and one of the ways that we do that is with IGMP. So, Paul, talk to us a little bit about IGMP and and how that's used in uh, network AV. Yeah, so absolutely. So IGMP is the protocol that's used <clears throat> to basically um, tell routers and switches for, for essentially for a device to join into a multicast. So uh, as Wiley mentioned early on, you've got these, these different uh, pieces of source content, let's say, and if you're doing unicast, um, you're going to have multiple copies and that's not very bandwidth efficient. Well, with multicast, you essentially have one copy on the network, but then something has to tell the network that it wants to receive that stream so that, for example, you don't have all multicast going to all endpoint devices. So um, in this case, this is where the IGMP protocol comes into play. Um, it's really used so that the um, the uh, devices on can tell the network, hey, I want to join and I want to receive this traffic um, or I want to leave this traffic or I want to leave this stream. So essentially it's a way of doing bandwidth management where we're using one copy of the content and then having the different devices that want to join into the multicast, um, you know, saying, yes, I want the stream. No, I don't want the stream. And that's what we have uh, IGMP uh, for. Great. Alex, you guys handle, uh, IGMP and and uh, in your protocols and your switches, so maybe you can kind of take this one to the next level, a little little deeper, right? Not to get too technical. Remember, our audience is really AV directors, not not IT managers. But address how Netgear is doing it and how Netgear is a little different. So, interestingly enough, and I want to add to a couple of things we said already that uh, not only I come from the IT side of the world into AV, so I've had. Uh, kind of the breadth of both and yes beer will solve a lot of your scenarios and uh, and and help uh, those relationship buildings with your IT team um, essentially OSPF is another one that is a default uh, network standard uh, for routing that advertises over multicast there's a lot of things that utilize multicast that are default in the switch that aren't AV related and so when your IT team is responding to you about 
uh, whether multicast can be added to the network or put on. Uh, it, it really does look to interfere with some of those routing protocols or some of those advertisements that are going to be happening on a, on a larger scale network. So that's why Netgear is in the AV space. That's why we came to uh, support the AV industry is because we knew that isolated and, and uh, segmented networks uh, with utilizing a specific uh, infrastructure for AV networks was a better idea than than putting it on the house network or putting it on a on a on an IT network and making them manage all of the flooding that takes place when you're doing multicast and and we likened it to unicast but really unicast is is a single communication it's a one to one uh, type of relationship it's it's I'm calling that house specifically and that house is going to answer the call and that is how unicast works broadcast is I'm in a giant room and I'm talking to everyone in that exact room and everyone can hear what I'm saying and they can also respond back to the conversation multicast is yes I'm still in that same room I'm still in that large domain uh, of communication however I don't care what the rest of these people want to say. I only want the people that want to hear what I want to say. Uh, that's multicast. Multicast is a broadcast essentially in its overall form. It's just an isolated to a relationship subscription uh, base that uh, allows us to communicate. And as you can see on this slide, which is kind of a death by PowerPoint, so I apologize for that, um, but it is a different IP range than your classical uh, class C 192.168 ranges that you might find on your home router. It's actually 224 up to 239 with the all 255s. And those are addresses that all the infrastructure will understand is a multicast address. Um, there's some invalid things that other companies utilize those addresses for that are specific to them. Um, but essentially, we allow for the, the communication utilizing those and the subscribers that communicate uh, utilizing those IP addresses. Now you got to understand the network switch, it speaks MAC address. Its goal is to forward and receive MAC addresses. So how does an IP range like a 224 up to 239 like it is, class D we call it, uh, wh how does that get translated in the switch? Well, it actually converts that IP address range into a multicast MAC address and allows for a communication on that MAC address channel um, so there are commonalities between the IP uh, reserved class D addresses of multicast and the MAC addresses that they all kind of share. So there is some tuning that you need to have, some automatic tuning that needs to be done. And that's uh, why Netgear has uh, been a very efficient multicast uh, uh, communicator. Yeah, so let's talk about that. What happens with multicast that's unmanaged? So without the IGM snooping, which is what we're talking about for managing this multicast traffic, Alex, continue and say, uh, you know, what happens to the switch? I think I've heard it called the Christmas tree. That's that's how you <laughs> decorate your uh, Christmas tree. Uh, yeah. Christmas. Yeah. So again, like I said, the domain is is a broadcast domain that we're utilizing <laughs> that same domain as a multicast domain. Um, and we're looking for those specific uh, subscribers. What IGMP snooping does is it looks for the subscriptions and the registered sources and binds them together. Now, it does kind of act as a linebacker too, kind of like in the in the line, making sure nothing comes through it uh, to, to prevent the ag aggressive flooding that multicast can be because like I said, it works as a, a broadcast if you don't control uh, the communication. So IGMP snooping controls that communication. It makes sure that there's a subscription and then it, it joins that to the stream uh, so that you can communicate between the channels. Now, um, the IGMP courier in this case will also keep the stream happening. So it will refresh the subscription for source communication coming into the switch and the host receiver for that communication. Now, netgear has gone a step further because we don't know, you know, switches are, are inherently, they're not smart devices. They have a very set uh, rule structure when the packet's coming into the port, going to the Mac controller and going out, it's a very set uh, kind of detailed uh, uh, definitions, right? Well, Netgear took it a little bit further and we'll get into detail on how it works, but we took a little further and enhanced the way multi-switch uh, communication works based in on the IGMP snooping structure. Great. So 
Now we've got this multicast traffic and we're putting it on the network and we want to plan, right? Because we want to know where that traffic's going. And that first step of that plan is, is bandwidth math. So Wiley, maybe talk about what we should be looking for, placing the encoders, decoders, and then what that traffic, how to, how to figure out that size. Just due to the nature of multicast, your, all your traffic is going to flood through the querier. So if you can control uh, where you place your encoders, ideally you would want them on the switch where the querier is. Um, just due to the fact that you're, you're going to conserve bandwidth on your, your, your links that go to uh, other areas of, uh, of your facility. So uh, calculating bandwidth for multicast is way easier than planning for unicast traffic because you got hard numbers. So you have eight encoders and you're roughly planning for you know a gig per encoder you're going to say eight gigs of traffic um whereas you know on, on unicast you could have you know 200 megs of traffic and an unknown amount of subscribers so there, there's a lot of unknowns there so with with multicast you got fixed hard numbers where you're gonna you know how many streams you're gonna have subscribers don't really matter and you're going to do your math based on the amount of uh, the encoders. So, so just based on eight gigs of video, uh, and you have a ten gig a ten gig link should be sufficient, uh, giving you twenty percent overhead. Um, yeah, so it where, really where comes into play when you get the two switches, right? So you, you're correct, talking about the flag connections between bandwidth math on a single switch is way easier. <laughs> yeah. It's all you Even want. Zero, just about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll kind of open it up to the to again bringing this back to the AV director, right? So, do I want to have a dedicated switch, or do I want a fully converged network? Some of that's going to depend on the relationship you have with IT, right? Who says well, you're not running multicast on my switch, Chris? What What do you do? What do you do in your system? Are you doing dedicated? Are you doing a fully converged? I'm doing dedicated. Um, one is because I can screw up my network and not affect anybody else, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> and as you can tell in my title, I'm at HSC. So we have a lot of medical things going on that I'd rather really not mess up. So yeah. I try and isolate it as much as I can. It also keeps things that are being applied as security patches currently uh, that would affect that. So I'm able to isolate. There's a physical disconnect between the main network and the AV network. And I'm able to bridge that using uh, processors that have both a WAN and a LAN port in essence on them. And this is, it lets me like, for instance, a recent situation that I had, I had multicast flooding going on in a system that should not be flooding between switches. The querier and everything was in one. Turned out the other switches were trying to act as a querier, even though they were told not to. I even had the IP set correctly to the <laughs> lowest. Once I figured that out, it was fine. But that took me a week of scratching my head and talking with my network engineers. And we were able to test things without affecting the rest of the network. So there's a lot of benefits but you have to have an access to that system. Uh, I, and that system that just stood up, it was a SimLab system. I still have a computer over there that I can remote into because I want that quick, easy access if there is a problem as we're going through the final vetting of the system. If you put it on a fully converged network, that is something you really need to discuss with your network engineers. There will be a lot of meetings. There will be a lot of things that you may not understand that they're talking about because they have to look at the bigger picture. And they have to look at how that affects security, how that affects load, and how that's handled. And just trust them on it. If they say that it's easier for you to be isolated, then figure that out along with them. But that relationship comes back into play there. And if you Great. need help, uh, my team, ProAV Design at Netgear.com, can help you with the design and implementation of that network. That's awesome, Alex. That, that's a great resource, right? Because, you know, we, we may not be coming from an AV or an IT background. I, I think it's uh, great that you're starting to see the convergence of these two. And I think Netgear does a great job of kind of being knowledgeable of AV, right? Where they've got kind of that whole AV interface to, to configure, or they can get into the full um, admin level access. Paul, from a product manager standpoint, fully converged or dedicated? 
Uh, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it is, is exactly what Chris said. It comes down to the policies and the willingness of the end user to uh, to work with you on that. And I think practically speaking, we see that most of our installations that use our equipment today end up being dedicated network infrastructure for all the reasons that Chris uh, mentioned. Um, but we do do some converged installations as well. And a lot of that comes in when you have an IT department that's worked with the AV team who's looked at it and said, actually, we'd like to just manage the whole network infrastructure. We've already got all the equipment in place and we're willing to work with you on it. We've been very successful. And a key thing is, is that if you if you do intend to, to, to explore the converged route, it's really important that you pick AV product that is very much standards compliant from a networking standpoint. In other words, implementing that IGMP, you know, per the standard, everything is done standards based so that it plays nicely. Multicast is, is very much a, a first a first party on a, on an enterprise network, um, but you wanna make sure that the AV equipment is adhering to all those standards. If the IT department wants to work that way, there's not really any problem doing it. Yeah, and that's a great point because, you know, the power of networked AV is it can be anything, anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So if you get an overflow situation, you know, you get into a situation where you've got to take a classroom with a bunch of students and maybe put them into two classrooms, it's a network switch. That's mm -hmm. way easier to, to move and to relocate than, than uh, traditional AV infrastructure is. Yep. Wiley, from a support standpoint, dedicated or fully converged? It, it it depends on who you're talking to on the other side of the phone, right? But, yeah, uh, and what their what their price of beer is. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, ideally, uh, just a dedicated is easier uh, because you have an entire view of the of the system. So uh, there's there's a lot less going on. Uh, you know, we see a lot of uh, you know they do. They do dedicated over converged, right? Where an IT department will just carve you out of a flat VLAN over their infrastructure, but it's you're you're still on an island, so it's not routed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and then Wiley, we'll stay with you, right? So now let's say, all right, we're fully converged. How do we manage this traffic? Because IGMP and the courier and, and managing those uplinks probably isn't going to be sufficient. So Talk to us a little bit about PIM and, and the, that configuration. Right. So if, if you're not just isolating your data within a, a confined, you know, layer two VLAN, you're going to need PIM because PIM is not, uh, is, is not uh, constrained by layer two boundaries or VLANs or subnets, as you may know them, you know, meaning you can route across uh, multiple subnets or VLANs. Um, we got two well-known implementations of PIM. You know, there, there's more. Um, sparse mode and dense mode. Uh, essentially, it comes down to efficiency. Sparse mode is, is is a little bit more efficient because it scales well as you grow. It builds trees without flooding. Um, you know, essentially, a, it, it's a subscriber table. And um, whereas dense mode, it, it it doesn't scale as well. So, and, and that'll really be up to your your IT director to decide which which route they want to go. So yeah, a little bit into the the weeds in PIM, but you know, just I wanted you guys to be aware of of ways to manage this protocol. So you know, don't be afraid, right? You're not going to kill anybody. Well, maybe Chris is, right? Because he's with <laughs> Health Science Center. But uh, <laughs> Chris, True. not True. to scare anybody, scary. but let's talk about horror <laughs> stories and how you fixed it and and what you what you ought to look for. Well, and, you know, that is, that is a true thing because you are on a system that can be carrying vital information. So you have to be very, very, very careful. And then, as we all know, higher ed and med are a huge target for hackers. So there is constant watching of that, too. So you are you're you're you've got a big target on your back and people's lives can be at stake. So you have to be very careful. Uh, the horror story for me would be that one dealing with the nursing sim lab where it was an isolated network that I had and have enough knowledge to set that up myself, but I was having those issues. As soon as I threw multicast on a system that already had AVB, the system was flooding and I couldn't figure out why. So that discussion with one of my trusted network engineers, he and I ran through different scenarios and that was one of the ones where he learned about AVB and because it was standard to me, 
And it was like, oh, yeah, this is normal because it is an IEEE standard. And he was unfamiliar with it. That actually came up in some of the chats here about asking, you know, some of the some of the network engineering may not be very familiar with multicast. And that is part of the reason why I put ours on isolated network. At first, I was told no from the higher ups. They wanted to. And then we looked at it and we're like, this this is going to be a problem. And I said, that's OK. Let's do it isolated. Let's do it simple. And it turned out that was the best choice. Uh, the fact that they were willing to even consider it, I was extremely happy about. So it was don't be afraid of that. No, that no is sometimes sometimes it's a blessing, honestly. But it allowed me and this network engineer to work side by side on trying to solve this problem it actually gave me some really good tools. One of them we'll mention later, but it allowed us to solve the issues that we were having and get the system working to where now I can trust that it is stable all the time. I'm not seeing any errors on it. I'm not seeing any lost packets. I'm not having any bandwidth issues and I don't have to worry about a firewall change or a, any other changes on the network that are constantly happening, affecting it because it is isolated. Uh, that's probably the worst horror story on it, uh, besides originally just messing around with multicast when it first came out from one of the products we use a lot of. And when that happened, I just put two or three boxes on an isolated network and tried to pass video. And I think I spent hours and hours. I think I finally figured it out at like five in the morning one day when I was messing with it to finally get it to work and figure out what the configuration was. I actually put it on a Netgear uh, was a GS724 version three. <laughs> so I was really pushing it hard, but it worked. And that was the worst that I've ever had to deal with, but the most learning. Uh, some of the slides we have here have a really good explanation that's really just kind of clean and concise based on versus what we find online. So I would highly suggest anybody that is watching this, grab the slide deck, especially that one with the terms. That will help you a ton. Grab these layouts of how this transmits, of how this works, and it will help you learn. And if you're lucky, you can get your networking to learn alongside with you if they don't already know. Awesome. Yeah, on, on that, let's talk a little bit on the tools. Yeah, there's several of them out there. I, this is not a comprehensive list of tools, but uh, on the Android size, uh, service browser, Bonjour browser can be very helpful for multicast. On the Apple side, it's um, Discover DNS, Wireshark. Uh, we teach it in our classes uh, if you're looking at Network AV. And then the one that Chris had brought up to me was the multicast hammer. Uh, I haven't played with that one, but I, I kind of did some uh, some looksies. We're going to share this content out, so if you you miss these these tools, you'll be able to refer back to them. And then a straight switch debug, right? So you can get into switches, and maybe Alex, you can talk about this next slide as far as the, uh, sure. the debug on what this means. Um, you know, again, don't get scared by all of this, but it does mean that you can find a lot of information. It's not like oh my god, all the lights are on. What's going on? You can dig into it and figure out what's going on. Yeah, so, uh, and thanks, Steve. That The one tool I would add to your list is uh, PTP Hound by Mindberg uh, can really dial in what you're looking for as far as the domain goes uh, when it comes to precision timing. Um, helps you know who your grandmaster, where your boundary clocks are, and uh, I use it, our team uses it uh, constantly. I'd, I'd love it if they'd just give it to us and we could put it in our, our centralized controller and gauge and then uh, go from there, but, you know, it's another conversation for another time. But uh, yeah, so this this table essentially came from our 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 enhancement. So we were able to collect certain data, um, and I could show you the other table that we use, which is called the MFDB. It's the Multicast Forwarding Database, and that one would make someone absolutely throw up in their mouth as soon as they saw it. They would be like, "That is too much for me." And so. We took that same table and we delineated it out to convert the the multicast MAC address that is converted on the switch into its IP address. So you knew which subscriber is where, and then we collect the subscriber's IP and MAC address uh, in the, in this table, and then we know what VLAN information they should be on uh, based on that information as well from the parsing of the packet and the configuration of the switch. So we collect the VLAN ID. 
the, the subscriber endpoint, um, the IP and MAC address, so you know kind of uh, where that system is. And then most importantly, what interface they are on. So you know that that device was connected to that interface and it's subscribed to that multicast group. Now, one thing that you'll see in this table is, wait a minute, I have multiple interfaces with multiple groups. That's because subscribe subscriptions, you can subscribe to multi, multiple multicast uh, you know, subscriptions for, say, discovery reasons or uh, you know maybe you have not just uh, like video but you also have audio on that same system or even USB extension off of that system those are all multicast signals that can come to and from that device and and Atlona specifically is one of the best uh, at creating multiple uh, capabilities on their switches on uh, to or on their uh, devices so that they can connect to the switch and subscribe to different multicast groups and then the the final item on the right the time which is another very, very important fundamental of the switch. That's counting back from 600 seconds. On Netgear switches, we give each subscription 600 seconds to continue and if there's no leave request sent from the endpoint to change to a different multicast group that port will receive that stream as long as that device is responding to query at the query interval default is 60 seconds so you should always see like a very healthy between 540 and 600 second time frame that's a very healthy communication that device is responding to our query messages and we're continuing to refresh that that back up to 600 seconds and counting back down uh, as it goes. So if you think about it, there's multiple opportunities in the 10 minutes of time that that device has to respond to a query message. If it, if it didn't, if it was overburdened or something like that, it has many opportunities to continue the streams that are coming out to it based on, on that table. So that table is a very, very helpful debugging utility that we have in our switches. Great. And it kind of dovetails into our next question. I think Dighton brought it up earlier about IGMP plus, right? <laughs> so that is a great tool that Netgear has. Again, now we're getting a little more into the product side and less into the multicast side. But talk to us a little bit about what that is, why it is and, and how it's useful. So the, it, it stemmed from a scenario that we built in a, a large deployment, uh, one of our first deployments in a high rise in New York City at One Hudson Yards. Um, there was a law firm that was setting up communication from our uh, from the 40th floor all the way up to the 48th floor uh, in this high rise. And what we saw, the, the typical IGMP layer two, we should be able to create a large domain, but still flood uh, correctly. And what we what we were observing is that we we're seeing subscribers from the 42nd floor not necessarily needing to be sent up to the 48th floor, but we saw that flooding happening on the 48th floor on our on our switch platform. And our engineers thought, well, well, wait a minute, that shouldn't be the case. But we found out that that's the way IGMP without PIM routing worked. And so what we did is we went and created a set of scripts and a, a, a set of designs to smart handle that communication in our networks so that it removed the need for large scale layer three PIM VLAN structure uh, so we didn't have to VLAN 42nd floor away from the 43rd floor. It created a very large network that allows the, the flooding to be selective uh, as it moves across the network. And, it, and you could say that it's the way IGMP should have been written to begin with. That's something that my manager, Laurent Mazia, who's the product line manager for all of our managed switches, um, it, it, that's what he coined that term. And it is very it is very possible that that's the way it should have been done because it, it, when you're sending into a network multi cast and you're seeing this erroneous flooding uh, that's coming from IGMP trying to forward upstream because the switches are unaware so our IGMP plus enhancement made all of the switches aware in the network uh, you can go to the next slide and I can show you kind of the the scenario that's essentially created with this all right, so in this in this simple diagram of a star topology, you see leaf switch one sending communication in and, and the communication from transmitter two is being stopped because there's no subscriber somewhere else in the network. If this was a network that was not utilizing IGMP plus, you would see transmitter three, four, two, all flooding to the courier as, as Wiley said earlier, because that's the way IGMP in that domain works. 
with an IGMP plus enhancement uh, portion of the network, we keep that all at the leaf switch level and, and prevent it from going to the spine switch until a subscriber like you see with TX1 and RX4, uh, you'll see that subscription come into the leaf switch two, subsequently be flood up to the spine switch and the leaf switch one, and then transmitter one will then be allowed to forward that transmission across. And it is a very, very important enhancement to the health and, and well-being of small and large uh, AV deployments. Yeah, and this is proprietary to Netgear, right? So all those switches right. need to be Netgear. Correct. And I mean, not necessarily, though. We can okay. turn this off, okay? We can enter in what we call classic design. This is the what we call enhanced design. So we can change to adapt to an interoperable state uh, and, and, you know, flood the multicast as requested by, by uh, the, the, uh, the other switch platforms out there. Great. And one Paul, of the big, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Alex. Sorry. Okay. No worries. And so how we make this work and how we, we keep this kind of cohesive for all of the you know video profiles or the audio profiles that you configure through the AVUI is once the IGMP plus enhancement is added, the leaf switch and spine switch share a communication hash across so that if you connect two neck gear switches together, we will bond them together and all the VLANs will be shared across that or what we call tagging in the IT world. We will preserve the tags across that link so that the VLAN structure, the broadcast domain, and the multicast domain stay together. Um, and that's a benefit of the IGMP plus enhancement and then adding the auto trunk, which now makes the out of the box uh, configuration and workability even better. If you bond uh, to, or excuse me, you add a link, we will bond those two links in what we call an aggregate. And uh, you can add up to eight total aggregates between our switches. Um, and we'll auto bond those doing the same thing we're doing with auto trunk. So the, the IGMP plus enhancement in conjunction with auto lag allows for you to scale up and deploy a network very, very quickly. Yeah, and that comes into that bandwidth math, right? When we figure out, oh, we have 12 encoders going into 10 gig switch. That's probably not gonna work going to need right. to add another, another connection. Yeah, Which... we always ask for aggregation switches. When we do our designs, uh, you know, I just had one come in for a, a casino in Phoenix that is going to be rather large. Um, they have uh, numerous one gig applications coming in. I mean, 78 in one of the IDFs that are going to be coming in. That's oh. a lot of bandwidth to manage. Um, so you're going to want an aggregator. And we have a scale up and scale down versions. Uh, the M4250 has an all 16 port that has a, a, around a terabit a backplane. We also have ones that go up to 6.4 terabit in backplane. So we, we really have a good non-blocking infrastructure. And with these uh, <laughs> software utilities, IGMP Plus, Autolag, and Auto Trunk, uh, we have a quick deployment method. Well, I, I know a great company that's got encoders and decoders. If, if you need those, uh, let's talk about that, Paul. What, <laughs> what makes OmniStream 2.0 different? I think Alex gave us a nice little shout out on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, OmniStream is at Lona's Network AV uh, product line. So this product line targets um, high quality, low latency distribution of video content across the network. And and really, we've got a couple of sort of claim to fame items about, about it. Uh, one is just the, the, the quality of our encoding. Uh, you really can't distinguish the source content from the encoded content. So it's really great in any environments where you're showing presentation content, uh, fine detailed content, uh, the, the encoded content looks as good as the original. Um, one of the other really great things that we've brought into our OmniStream 2.0 though, which is really designed to help with that bandwidth management that we've kind of touched on several times today, is that we added two independent scalers to our encoders. And so now you can actually do two streams at two different uh, resolutions and two different bit rates. So for example, you might say, well, I'm in a, I'm in a lecture theater, I'm in an auditorium, or I'm within a building on a campus, and everything is going to be home run to a switch, and I'm going to use a high-quality 4K stream there. But I'm also wanting to send that content to an overflow room, and maybe that overflow room is in another building on campus. Maybe I'm traversing some existing links that are there, and I'm, and I'm really having to be a bit um, cautious about how much bandwidth I'm utilizing. So with OmniStream 2.0, we're able to say, well, you can send that 4K stream, 
Um, and uh, you can also, in parallel, send a much lower bitrate 1080p stream that can be used um, anywhere that you have to deal with uplink traversal and you're having to be con you know, concerned about how much bandwidth you're consuming through your uplink. Uh, we also, in Omnistream 2.0, we support things like 4K60 fast switching, which, again, along with the video quality, makes for a very professional-looking presentation because as you're switching sources, it kind of happens just seamlessly between devices. And then the other really uh, marquee feature is our multi-view capability, which has some great applications in education. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see a kind of classic example of a uh, networked AV system. Again, back to all, all the way back to what Steve kind of introed, you've got the network switch acting in a way as your AV switch. Now here you're seeing um, all of my individual sources going to individual displays and it's sort of one-to-one -one in this drawing, but uh, the reality is I could take player one and I could send it to all four displays or just to two, it's, or I could send one player to one display as we're, as we're showing. What's great is with OmniStream 2.0 and our multi-view functionality, I can still send that content from uh, an encoder uh, to a display full screen, as you see there in the in the first three displays. But then I can also do things where I can create multi-view layouts. I can take multiple streams off of the network and composite them. So in this case, we're showing a quad view but it could be a PIP, it could be a side-by-side. -side. So this starts to become really powerful when you start to think about overflow scenarios, um, active learning spaces, anywhere you're trying to compare multiple pieces of content together. And we're able to do this just using encoders and decoders and the network. We don't have to bring in any windowing processors or other AV equipment into the system design. So that's kind of a very high level overview of, of Omni and some of the, the advantages it brings to a network deployment. Thanks, Paul. And yeah, we've been using that on the design side for esports, collaboration classrooms, computer classrooms. And that's what we can do. You know, bring bring your questions to us. I think there's some questions that we thought we had addressed in, in the uh, in the chat. Um, Dwight asked, uh, should AVB be separated from Dante with VLANs? Yes, yes, 100%. The, the, the reason for that is, I mean, you can you could probably get away with it if you're not doing any uh, um, PTP v2. However, I would caution that PTP, GPTP, um, which is what AVB uses, uh, really is something that should be isolated from the network. Um, it should not be on the same as like a Dante or an IGMP domain. And Dante is going to do an IGMP unless you're in unicast mode. There is a unicast mode for Dante, so you could get away with it in unicast mode. But I would I would uh, caution in an IGMP domain, um, and we actually have a white paper. I, I, just, I keep saying it that way, but it's not a white paper. It's a configuration guide that shows us how to do that on a Netgear switch. We actually the AVB uses an MVRP stream of VLAN two, so we avoid VLAN two. We configure another VLAN for AVB, and then we we isolate those into a trunk that goes across a, a, a link for. <laughs> Uh, for its its own network, and you can't utilize link aggregation for AVB, so you don't want to you want to go into that route. You'll need to use a trunk uh, between the two switches, preferably 10 gig if you're doing a large deployment, and then you can have a Dante VLAN uh, and its own isolated. And there, we like I say we have a whole document that'll break that down, uh, and also there's an adjustment to spanning tree that you need to do uh, in order to get those things working. Great. And then I think there was another question on the uh, 4250 switches. Is there a configuration drawing for the 4300, 4500, and 3300 switches? I want to set up in a way that shows beginner, medium, and advanced setup. I don't want to throw out any switches as I upgrade. That's a good question. So um, we don't have anything, I would say, that's like... I, we did one for uh, an integrator that was out there in Philadelphia. They actually were doing the Merck offices. Of, uh, shout out to the medical uh, gentleman here, the, you know, over there, Chris, uh, that's been working on. On you know, he's probably had some Merck uh, quality equipment in there. But um, they were doing their offices, and they wanted like a small, medium, and large size. So we did that special for them. But if you reach out to us at ProEV Design at Netgear.com, again, ProEV Design and Netgear.com, we will customize 
us any uh, configuration that you're looking for. You can just give us the amount of ports that you're looking for, the type of signals you're looking to produce, and then we can we can build you out some systems that uh, you can you can literally like go to the bomb, grab that, deploy it, um, and we even can have, add uh, the topology guide as well. And then Wiley, I don't know if you can do a a brief description of dense PIM. That may be a whole nother webinar. It's, yeah, uh, I, I think probably Googling it would be a, more beneficial than trying to explain it. Chat, <laughs> yeah. Chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think Mark mentioned in the chat, he said multicast is barely even mentioned in Cisco CCNA. And, you know, when I, when I went through CCNA, like seven questions, I, I'm not I even sure it was mentioned once. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a le there's, you got to understand in the CCNA, there's 11,000 questions. They test you on 90 of them. It's a very difficult right. test. Um, and that that uh, multicast is always like a CCMP type thing. They kind of yeah. take it to the next level. Routing and switching is CCNA. So it's like it, it kind of condenses it. But still, 11,000 questions. You only talk about it like once or twice. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, and I think it is interesting on that exam. If you answer one wrong and you get that exam question in a different format, then you realize you answered the first one wrong and change your answer on number two. Not yeah, that I have yeah. personal experience in that at all. <laughs> you know, that one question. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. It is a tough test. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't wish it on anyone. I've gone through it myself. It's, it's a, it's a rough one. I, I did end up completing it and passing it, and I, you know happiest day of my life when I saw yeah. that past uh, thing, you know. And now you like, got to refresh it very soon, right? And that's the problem, <laughs> right? It, it's you're not done. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, yeah. Uh, it takes that uh, Infocom CTS credit to a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, not, the best answer needs to be the Cisco answer. Right. Yeah, that's right. Design, well, that's there. <laughs> that's why it's got. That's why you have to refresh it. Is because they make so many changes to iOS, and then they have now this whole IPv6, which is now the majority of uh, of the routing and switching side. So yeah, you've got to you got to stay up on the standards. It's tough. Yeah, they don't. It's CCNA, but it is Cisco certified that's right. network that's associate. Right. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's guys. That's also, that's where you use. This has been a great discussion, and I hope to do more of these. I'm depending on Absolutely. you, the audience. Come up with topics you want us to cover, uh, whether it's uh, you know about uh, AV, about networking. You know, I'm trying to make these necessary, not necessarily product related, but more technology related. So Absolutely. let us know what you want to see. Also, go to our website. Re register to be an education VIP if you're an education customer. That allows you to get points on your purchases. We're going to have discussion groups there in the future. And then uh, after this presentation, we're going to ro roll the credits and they're going to show everybody's contact information. So feel free to reach out to myself, any of the other panelists, if you have questions, comments. If you've got complaints, we reserve the right to throw beer at you the next time we see you. Just saying. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great day.